Roger Shamel. I live in Bedford, Massachusetts, and I'm a founding director of WEN, the Global Warming Education Network, which will be six years old um, next year. I'm, to, to get into a little bit of a background, not what you would call a nature-loving tree hugger from birth. In fact, I have a born into a Republican family in the Midwest, in Ohio, and grew up voting Republican and actually still adhere to many of the values that um, the Republican Party had then and still has today. For example, I, I don't like regulation per se. I don't like big government per se. I don't enjoy paying taxes and then hearing that the government's spending $100 for a hammer or, or something like that. I was a member of a group that was against uh, government waste. Despite all that background, the fact of the matter is that it wasn't until six years ago when one of my daughters suggested I go see this movie she had seen called An Inconvenient Truth that was put out by Al Gore. And I distinctly remember up until that point I had read about climate change and you know, I get the chemical magazines and, and I basically thought, well, it's just some scientific argument back and forth. And when they figured out, you know, the government, as it always does, uh, will step in and solve the problem. So, um, sitting through Inconvenient Truth for an hour and a half or so is the first time that I'd really been able to or forced to think about the climate change issues and being able to understand the graphs that Gore had pulled together and he admitted he wasn't a scientist, he's just pulling together the research that's been done. I thought, oh my God, this really is a problem and so why isn't the government doing more? And um, that was the beginning of uh, thinking about Gwen. From the point of Gwen and of my involvement is this, is that as a human who cares about other humans and as a parent and a grandparent and someone who has compassion for people, I just don't like the situation I find myself in, uh, seeing us moving towards a problem that's getting bigger and bigger, being involved in a problem that's getting bigger and bigger without doing something about it when we have the technology and the money to solve the problem. It's just like, you know, it's mind-boggling to me. It's the role of the government, which has, by the way, spent roughly $20 billion over the past couple of decades researching climate change, and the information is there on a government website. If you go to globalchange.gov, you can find the results. Uh, unfortunately, there's so much information there that it, it's like information overload, but information has been summarized in booklets that are available from the government. And you, you look at the booklet, and I, I have them right here, and you've got a dozen government offices and agencies that have put their stamp on the booklet, which is giving this information. And it includes the Office of the President, you know, the White House, the, the Department of State, the military, they're all there. The, the National Academy of Sciences, which Lincoln started a long time ago to help inform Congress about science. You mentioned the tar sands action in Washington, which took place at the end of August and beginning of September. That was something that my wife Susan and I thought long and hard about because we're not the type of citizen that would voluntarily disobey a police order to move, but that's what we did in a sit-in in front of the White House on August 31st. And so we were arrested and taken to jail for a short time, and because it's a very minor offense, we were allowed to uh, post a $100 uh, fine and be released immediately with hopefully no police record. And, um, you know, why would we do this? Because we're very, very concerned about the future of um, the climate 
and um, the whole purpose of Gwen was to form a nonprofit that would try to educate people about climate change and encourage them to act, to do something to help to stop it or at least slow it down. So time will tell whether the um, arrests in Washington, which numbered 1,252 uh, law-abiding citizens, will have an impact. Uh, hopefully it will. We're basically asking President Obama, who has the sole power to do so, to veto the Keystone XL pipeline, which will take tar sands from Alberta, Canada, down to the Gulf Coast of the United States to be refined in Texas and then sold on the world market. And the concern is that we're continuing to feed the fossil fuel addiction that President Bush admitted we had uh, when he was president. And now we're getting into the really dirty fossil fuels instead of the nice, clean, easily developed ones. And um, to quote Jim Hansen, our leading climate scientist from NASA, the exploitation and development of the tar sands of Canada, which is the second largest oil reserve on the planet outside of Saudi Arabia or the Middle East, will basically mean game over for the climate. And it's not like the Keystone Pipeline is, um, in terms of the fuel involved, going to be the be-all and end-all. It, it represents a small percent of the world total consumption. It's more a symbolic thing because, as I mentioned before, President Obama has the ability, because it crosses an international border, to say yes or no to the project based on whether it's in the national interest of the United States. And if you consider a livable climate being in the national interest of the United States, which I think it is, and if the pipeline represents a continuation of our moving down the path on the fossil fuel path, then it's not in the national interest. And despite the fact that it will create some short-term jobs while the pipeline is being built, we have to look beyond the short-term jobs, as I explained before, towards the long-term future and say no to the pipeline. There, there's tremendous opposition to it getting out of Canada by other routes. And if people speak up enough, we can keep the tar sands in the ground where they belong and not contribute to the, the climate change that we can't tolerate. And, and at the same time, we can protect the aquifer that the pipeline will be going through in the United States. We can protect the boreal forests in Canada that are being decimated to develop the tar sands. The perception I have is that today, smart business people who have a lot of money have figured out how to influence the government more than in the past with contributions to politicians and with public relations firms and with media like Fox News, which is, you know, everybody thinks it's just another news station, but when you dig deeper, you realize that it's more like a propaganda outlet for the right wing under one of the wealthiest men in the world, Rupert Murdoch, who's recently been in quite a bit of trouble for doing illegal wiretapping to get news. And, and you know, to, to uh, Murdoch, it seems that getting the story and selling papers and amassing more money is his objective. And truth is out the window more and more. And doing the right thing is out the window more and more. In a huge public relations success, to, to I, I give credit to it being successful to achieve the objective of trying to discredit the scientists, um, <laughs> Fox News keeps bringing up climate gate that, you know, this shows the scientists were cheating and they, they ignore the fact that independent boards since then have totally exonerated the scientists and the public relations campaign to discredit climate change and call it a hoax and to have our politicians such as the uh, leading senator in Oklahoma, Jim, Jim Inhofe, call it a hoax publicly. Um, 
you trace where the money's coming from, and it's coming from largely fossil fuel interests, and there are public records that document this. So we have politicians who are taking a lot of money from the industry that benefits most from climate change in the sense that they're selling the fossil fuels that we're burning that release the carbon dioxide that are going, is going to the atmosphere to cause the enhanced greenhouse effect and heating up the earth. Those people are basically trying to preserve the status quo, which leaves them sitting on top of the largest and most profitable industry on the planet, which is the fossil fuel business. When you're in a business, you're supposed to not only optimize the short-term profits, but you're supposed to make the company sustainable. That's the, the balancing act. You, you, you aren't going to uh, be rewarded if the company goes bankrupt. So by all rights, the fossil fuel companies should redefine themselves from being in the petroleum or oil business to being in the energy business. They should be taking the profits they make from the extraction and refining of oil which is currently at the point where we're at the, the peak amount of production of the known fossil fuel reserves that are clean and um, easily mined and refined to investing in the energy of the future, which is wind and solar, to keep the company going as an energy company. But the human nature part of it is, and I've run into these executives in my travels, is that it's, you know, it, it's just much easier to come into work the next day and keep pursuing the fossil fuels that you've been doing for a long time, you know, do more of it, you know, drill down deeper and at angles and go under the, the deep water, which led to the BP spills in the Gulf Coast. It's easier to do that than to say, okay, we're going to turn ExxonMobil around from being an oil company and we're going to make it an energy company and we're going to develop the energy of the future. I mean, it, there's 10,000 times more energy coming from the sun every day than we use every day. So we just need to capture a very, very small percentage of that energy and we can develop battery technology to deal with the night and day problem. We can move the energy around the planet if we invest in infrastructure for the, the grid. Uh, all of these problems are solvable, but because it's a lot easier to go to work and continue to be an oil company or to be a, a media executive, we're basically heading down this path where the oil executives and, and the Koch brothers who run the second largest private company on the planet, which is largely in the oil business, are funding politicians, including the Tea Party politicians, who are moving into government and unfortunately pushing our government towards an agenda that is optimizing the short term, continuing the, the role of the fossil fuel companies as the leaders, and again, it's wrong and this is where we need real leadership, such as we saw, you know, when FDR at the time of World War II encouraged the automobile companies to stop making cars. In fact, he didn't encourage them. He, he told them in a nice way, I guess, that you're going to stop making automobiles and you're going to start making airplanes. And, and they complained and uh, later came around to understanding that it, he was serious and that it was urgent. And they doubled the production quota that FDR asked for because it was necessary to defeat, um, you know, the evil forces that were involved in World War II. Well, we're facing a similar situation today, but multiplied by a factor of a hundred because, you know, the climate is home to seven billion people, not to mention the plants and animals uh, that compose our planet. And we need leadership to recognize the problem, the research has been done, the technology is there. We've got to stop answering the siren call of the money to do whatever the wealthy people say and answer the call of humanity to preserve a livable climate. If Obama would go on prime
prime time national TV, similar to what he did last night speaking to Congress about jobs, and get Secretary of Energy Chu on one side and his science advisor John Holdren of, of Harvard on the other side, and the military leaders, retired and otherwise, who have also said that climate change is a very serious problem for the country. And, you know, anybody else he wants, I mean, he's the president, he, he could get uh, a cadre of great people to support him on this speech, and he'd simply take an hour and explain to the American people, you know, look folks, climate change is real, it's serious, it's urgent, and we've got to deal with it. And we're going to do that, and we're going to work together, and we're going to solve this problem, and everything will be fine. And that's all true. We have the money, we have the technology, we just lack the will to do it because most people think everything's fine because climate change isn't that obvious. It's time for people to act because for the, the sake of ourselves and our children and everyone we care about, it's a problem that is not going to go away by ignoring it. It's a problem that we can deal with if we work together and it's time to do that now before it's too late. On the 24th of September there's uh, another Bill McKibben, 350.org action called Moving Planet. And this is um, going to be taking place on every continent on the Earth um, with the idea that we want to encourage our fellow citizens and our elected officials to move beyond fossil fuels and to get with this energy transition that we have to go through. So. We're asking people around major cities, or, or 350.org is asking people, and, and you can go to uh, their website and find links to Moving Planet, to assemble in a major city with a rally and um, discussion among the people involved, and hopefully to attract media attention to, again, help get the word out that this is a problem that we need to deal with. Um, but also, there will be on October 7th and or 8th in Washington and perhaps else, elsewhere uh, a follow-up to the tar sands action in Washington because that's the date that's set for the final hearing about the Keystone Pipeline.